morning, our scripture reading comes from the Old Testament book of Judges, chapter 6, verses 33 through 40, found on page 240 in your pew Bibles. Judges chapter 6, 33 through 40. Now all the Midianites, Amalekites, and other eastern peoples joined forces and crossed over the Jordan and camped in the valley of Jezreel. And the Spirit of the Lord came on Gideon, and he blew a trumpet, summoning the Abizarites to follow him. He sent messengers throughout Manasseh, calling them to arms, and also into Asher, Zebulun, and Naphtali, so that they too went up to meet them. Gideon said to God, If you will save Israel by my hand as you have promised, look, I will place a wool fleece on the threshing floor. If there is dew only on the fleece and all the ground is dry, then I will know that you will save Israel by my hand as you said. And that is what happened. Gideon rose early the next day. He squeezed the fleece and wrung out the dew, a bowl full of water. Then Gideon said to God, Do not be angry with me. Let me make just one more request. Allow me one more test with the fleece, but this time make the fleece dry and let the ground be covered with dew. That night God did so. Only the, fe- the fleece was dry. All the ground was covered with dew. The word of the Lord. The story of Gideon throwing out his fleece on the threshing floor is uh, one of those stories that we learn from our very earliest years in the church, and he does this to discover what God's will is. Sounds simple enough. Gideon wants to know whether or not he should proceed in a certain way, so he asks God to reveal the answer through a sign. And if the sign appears according to Gideon's request, then he knows that he can proceed with God's approval and with God's blessing and with God's assistance. Since this is such a well-known story, is it teaching us that if you want to know the will of God in our, in our, our life, then we need to do as Gideon did and just simply throw out our fleece and God will give us the answer. And I want to tell you unequivocally that the answer is no. That is not what this story is teaching us. In fact, to look at the details of this story, Gideon, the mighty man of valor, as the angel of the Lord calls him, is not presented in a very good light. He's not. Gideon is presented as being hesitant and reluctant and uneasy about doing what God had already called him to do. So the act of throwing out this fleece was actually a demonstration of unbelief on Gideon's part. And it was only by the patience and the tolerance and the grace of God that Gideon's sign was answered. So we can say right from the start that this lesson is not that we are to throw out our own fleeces. Instead, we have to look a little bit deeper to find what this text can actually teach us about finding the will of God in our own lives. That's an important subject for people of faith, isn't it? If, as I have said in past studies, that each and every person is known by God even before they ever take a breath in this life, and that each person has meaning and purpose given to them by our Creator, then isn't it vital for us to know the plan and the purpose that God has for our lives? And I think the answer is yes. In other words, it's important for us to know God's will. What does God want me to do with my life? Should I get married? Should I stay single? Should I pursue a career in in this field or should I pursue a career in another field? These are the big questions in life that often come up and we have to face. But there are also much smaller decisions that we encounter in which we desperately want the guidance of God. Those smaller issues can, can really be anything. Anything that's important to you that you want God's direction on. Wouldn't it be nice to say, uh, you know, God, I don't really know what to do here. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take this this wool fleece, and I'm just going to chuck it outside my door. And in the morning, if it's this way, then I know what to do. And if it's the other way, then I know that that I need to not do that and and pursue something else. Wouldn't that be nice to do? Very easy thing to do. But as I said, this is not what this text is teaching us. How do you go about trying to discern God's will for your life? I've heard people treating the Bible like it was a magic book, so then when they're faced with a problem and they're not really sure what to do, but they want to know what God says about it, well, that they shut their eyes, they flip to a random page in Scripture, and they just sort of point, and then they open their eyes just to see what the Word of God says. Is that the way to, to find the will of God in your life? 
Of course, what usually happens when you do something like that and like randomly flipping to a page and blindly pointing to a verse is that we end up pointing to a verse like Matthew 27, 5. Then he went out and hanged himself. No, we don't like that one. We don't want that to be God's guidance in our lives. So we, we shut our eyes and we open the Bible and we point to another one. And then we end up like John 13, 27. And what you're about to do, do quickly. No more jokes this morning, apparently. Pretty slow out there. Thank you, Karen. Finally. Blindly pointing to a random verse of Scripture is not the way to determine the will of God for our life. Perhaps some people turn to their horoscopes. My horoscope says that I'm going to fall in love today. Or my horoscope says I'm not supposed to make any big purchases today. No, we do not find the will of God in the horoscope section of the newspaper or inside a fortune cookie or something like that. In fact, one time I... I I like Chinese food, so we went and uh, had supper, and I cracked open my fortune cookie, and it was blank. It's like, what does that mean? Although throwing out a fleece is not an example that we should follow in trying to determine God's will for our lives, we can find some pretty powerful truths in this text that will help us discover God's will. And my prayer is that as we make our way through this portion of the book of Judges, that you will be able to see those truths and allow the work of God to function in your own life and then in, in finding that will. And in doing so, you'll find the peace that comes from knowing that you are doing exactly what God has called you to do. And the first thing I would like to point out is simply this, that God reveals his will to those who will receive it. This might seem like a very basic idea, and indeed it is, but it is also a very important one. You see, if you're going to have uh, some kind of a a crisis in your life, and you're trying to figure out, you know, what am I going to do with myself? If you're asking those questions, but you don't really have any real desire to know God's will in your life, you want some will, but you don't necessarily want God's will, then you're probably not going to be actively searching for the answer through God. You're going to be looking for lots of other answers and lots of other places. But added to that is the notion of, of wanting to follow the will of God in your life, or perhaps agreeing to it. Maybe we could say it that way. I remember when I was first feeling the call of God in my life to pastoral ministry, I was open to knowing what was going on. I wanted to know what I should do with myself. So I was, generally speaking, I was open to knowing the will of God, but when it came, became clear that the will of God was that he was directing me to the pastoral ministry, I was very, very, very reluctant in fact, I said, no, I'm not doing that. Being a pastor was never a part of my plans. It was no, something I'd never even considered before. And more than that, my wife did not marry a pastor. She can't even play the piano. Sorry, honey. So I would feel God's call, and therefore I knew God's will but I said, no, I don't want to do that. And I continued saying no for about two years. And I can tell you in all honesty that those were a two miserable years. I was unhappy. I was unsettled. Uh, settled, I was unfulfilled. I was restless, probably crabby. You can ask my wife. I don't know. And all that continued until I said Yes. I know I've shared this story with you in the past, but I needed to break the news to my wife that she was going to be having a pastor as a husband, and she was going to have to learn how to play the piano. <laughs> so I took her out for coffee at Perkins Restaurant, and I, I broke the news with great uneasiness and told her that God was calling me to the pastoral ministry. And of course, she heard none of that. What she heard was that we were moving to Africa. I assured her that it was to the pastoral ministry that God was calling me to and not to the foreign mission field. But she was on board, probably a little scared, uh, as I was, but she was on board, and uh, the rest, as they say, is history. Gideon was called by God for a specific purpose at a specific time, and he first appears in the book of Judges, chapter 6, at a time when the people of God needed the words of a prophet. Prophet. 
However, as is often the case in the history of God's people, they were experiencing a time of God's judgment due to ignoring the covenant and doing evil in the sight of the Lord. That seems like a common uh, repetitive theme all throughout the Old Testament. Judges chapter 6 tells us that the Lord gave the people into the hands of the Midianites for a period of seven years. And during that time, the Midianites were so oppressive and so hostile to the people of God that, that the, the people are actually had to make their dwellings among, amongst the, the rocks and the mountains and live in the caves. That's how they were su- surviving. Fortunately, however, the land around them was very, very fertile. And so the people would go down from the mountain and the caves and they would plant everything that they needed to survive. But as soon as those crops began to come up, something would happen. The enemy, the Midianites and the Amalekites, would swoop in like locusts and they would destroy everything in the land, all the crops, so that there was literally nothing left for the people of God to survive on. And they were dying. And as as is often the case with the wayward people, it is not until they are faced with absolute ruin that they finally are willing to turn back to God and call out to him. And that was the case here. The people finally cry out to God, help us. They needed to hear from God, and God was going to answer. But he needed a prophet to speak to the people on his behalf. And here we are introduced to Gideon. When the angel of the Lord appeared to Gideon, he said, The Lord is with you, mighty warrior or mighty man of valor. Quite a greeting for a simple farmer, hiding in the rocks, right? Gideon asked the angel a simple but important question. Where's God been? What's he been doing while his people were suffering and hiding in these caves and rocks? What's he been doing? I want to know. Where were the miracles that the, the people like me were taught about, about this God who leads his people out of bondage from Egypt? All these miracles that were associated with it. We haven't seen anything like that of this God. And of course, during a time of judgment, God's hand is often unseen, so it's not unreasonable that they didn't see those kinds of things. But this is how the angel of the Lord replies to Gideon. Go on the strength that you have and save Israel out of Midian's hand. Am I not sending you? In other words, God has just called Gideon into divine service. Gideon is called to be part of God's solution, which means that God's will for this simple farmer is that he is going to be a mighty man of valor, if he accepts the will of God for his life. And by the way, that is often the case when we embrace the call of God. He can take us in our simple, our non-special, our normal, everyday lives and transform us into people who can do great, great things for the people of God, things that we could have never even dreamed were possible. And God can use us to do those things. And of course, Gideon is baffled by this, this call of God. The Midianites and all the surrounding nations who have joined in this this plunder of the land are more than formidable. They're very scary people. They're numerous, which is why God's people have been living among the rocks and in the caves in the first place. So Gideon replied, but how can I save Israel? My clan is the weakest in Manasseh. I am the least in my family. That is, I am no one from a clan of no ones. How is it that you think that I can save Israel? And this is what God tells Gideon, I will be with you. I will strike down all the Midianites, leaving none alive. So how can Gideon save Israel? And the answer is he can't, unless God is with him. And then he can. And if God is with him, Gideon, the simple farmer, will be transformed into Gideon, the mighty man of valor. God has called Gideon to defeat the enemy nations. There's a great battle that is going to take place, and Gideon, as God's chosen, will be the leader of God's people. And so we know what Gideon has been, and been tasked with, and now, in our reading for today, the enemy is making their move. Now all the Midianites, the Malachites, and other eastern peoples joined forces and crossed over the Jordan and camped in the valley of Jezreel. The time is drawing near, and as verse 34 tells us, that the Spirit of the Lord came on Gideon, and he blew a trumpet, summoning the Abyssalites to follow him. And all those people that were uh, hiding, you know, they were afraid of the, the enemy who was coming near. And yet, when they hear that trumpet, that shofar that Gideon blows, they're inspired. Quite the story. So, 
God's spirit comes to Gideon. He does what the Lord is asking him to do. He empowered Gideon to do it. But something I want to point out here is that the Hebrew word about the, the spirit coming to Gideon is actually something that better des- is better described as putting on a jacket. The spirit clothed Gideon in this particular instance. So the picture that is given to us is is of God's will being known to Gideon, Gideon being empowered to carry out God's will, and Gideon performing the actions needed to accomplish God's will. He has blown the trumpet, summoning the people to battle, with Gideon now appearing as this mighty man of valor, this military leader, and the people are inspired to follow him. Oh, we're going to do something about this now. So he sent messengers throughout Manasseh, calling them to arms and also to Asher and Zebulun and Nephtali, all the surrounding tribes, so that they too went up to meet them. What was God going to do about the oppression and the mistreatment that God's people had been facing? He was going to raise up the right people to carry out his will. That's what God was going to do. And in this instance, God's will was for Gideon to lead the people. And so we can say God reveals his will to those who will receive it. There was no question about what lay ahead or what God had asked Gideon to do. God called Gideon to service and he empowered him for that mission to accomplish this task. Gideon knows God's will. Everything is crystal clear. There is no question. But, it's always a but, isn't there? But something begins to happen in the mind of Gideon. Perhaps he looked out at the enormity of the enemy there who had gathered in the valley of Jezreel. He looked at their strength, he looked at their number, and he he begins to hear this this little whisper in his ear. Are you sure about this? This looks like it's scary. This looks like a, a battle we can't win. Are you sure you're doing the right thing? Have you ever heard that little whisper in your ear calling into question Something that you know that God has called you to. That brings us to a very important truth in regarding God's will, and that God's will is revealed through his word. Does God's will ever involve us doing something that might seem impossible? Yep, certainly can. Remember that God told Gideon, go in the strength that you have and save Israel out of Midian's hand. The strength that he has Well, an impossible task for Gideon to accomplish on his own. But the promise is that he is not on his own. God is with him, and it is through God's presence and assistance that this impossible feat is going to be accomplished. And it is here where we read about the familiar story of the fleece. Gideon said to God, If you will save Israel by my hand, as you have promised, look, I will place a wool fleece on the threshing floor, if there's dew only on the fleece and all around, all around it, the ground is dry, then I will know that you will save Israel by my hand, as you have said. I want to point out a couple of things in this section. The first is that Gideon repeated what God has already told him, already revealed to him about what God's will is. If you will save Israel by my hand, as you have promised, that is to say, Gideon knew what God was, was going to do, because he already promised it. And the second thing I want to draw your attention to is why Gideon wanted to use this fleece as a sign. Here's the answer. The promise of God for Gideon was not enough. It was not enough. Gideon was looking for additional assurance that God was indeed faithful, that God was indeed with him, And if God would perform a sign with this fleece, then Gideon says, I will know that you will save Israel by my hand, as you have said. There it is again. Didn't Gideon already know? Yeah, he did. Does that sound like a great man of faith? Sounds to me like a guy who is questioning the promise of God. A guy who is afraid of the task that is now uh, directly facing him because of the sheer magnitude of the enemy. He's afraid, and that fear causes him to to question. Gideon sounds a lot like like you and me, doesn't he? Do we ever question the word of God? 
Do we ever look for additional assurances that God's promises are indeed true? So what is the purpose of the fleece? Well, the answer is that it acts as a sign of reassurance that God's word is true and can be trusted. Now you might be thinking, well, I've never received a divine calling from an angel of the Lord. Therefore, how can I compare my life and knowing God's will for me to what happened to Gideon? Well, that's a fair line of questioning. I'm glad you, I'm glad you asked that. You're keeping me on my toes. And the truth is, divine revelation has taken on a very different form from that that was sometimes found in the Old Testament scriptures. From the Old Testament perspective, the angel of the Lord comes to reveal the will of God. The spirit of God comes to Gideon for strength. That is, he comes from the outside to anoint Gideon for divine service. But from a New Testament perspective, that kind of revelation is no longer necessary. For you and me, God has already revealed everything he wants to reveal. Where do we find God's revelation? And the answer is in Scripture. What is Scripture? It is the Word of God. And because of our faith, the Holy Spirit does not come from the outside to us. Rather, the Spirit of God makes his dwelling right here, within us. So although you might desire an appearance of the angel of the Lord, because that would be neat or something like that, the truth of the matter is that God's revelation from a New Testament perspective is more complete than any personal encounter found throughout all the Old Testament. You don't need to have a fleece, in other words. Gideon actually did something that he was not supposed to do and that he asked for a sign. Asking for a sign is actually a sign of our unbelief. As Jesus points out to the Pharisees, it's not something that you should do. And yet God gave the assurance that Gideon was looking for by doing what he asked. Well, why did he do that? Well, we'll get into that for just one, in just a second. But Gideon said that he would throw out this wool fleece. And if the fleece was drenched in the morning with dew, but the ground was dry, then he would know for certain that God's words were true, what God's will is. And sure enough, that is exactly what happened. Gideon rose early in the next day, and he squeezed out this fleece, and he wrung out uh, the dew of it, and he got a whole bowl full of water. Good morning drink. I like to describe this part of the story as God condescending to condensation. God answered Gideon's request for a sign. But the lesson is that a sign should not have been required in the first place. God had already made his will known to Gideon, and the only thing that this uh, uh, revealed here was Gideon's lack of faith in God's word. I hope we can learn from Gideon's poor example that God has already revealed his will, and it is up to us to accept that will through faith and live according to that truth that God has revealed to us. God's word should be enough. We shouldn't need an additional proof that God's word is true. We should trust that God's will is revealed through his word and live according to that word in full assurance that he is with us and he will bring about what he has promised. That's a life of faith. But I think we need to explain this concept a little further in order to see its broader application in our own life. So our third truth for this morning is simply this, that God's word and spirit agree in revealing his will for us. You would think that God's word And now this sign would be enough for Gideon, right? But can you believe that it wasn't? Gideon actually needed more. So what does he do? He asks God for another sign. And Gideon said to God, do not be angry with me. Let me just make one more request. Allow me one more test with the fleece, but this time make the fleece dry and let the ground be covered with dew. Gideon knew that he was pressing his luck. He knew very well that one request was bad enough, but now he wants another one? Gideon wanted even more assurance about God's will for his life because he was was afraid, as we said. Of course, it begs the question, how much divine assurance is enough for you and me to live in obedience? Like I mentioned earlier, this text is not teaching us to throw out our own fleeces Yet in another instance of patience, God condescends to condensation. You can coin that phrase and say, Pastor Shane came up with that one. 
This time, the very opposite of the first sign is a request that Gideon makes. In the morning, if the fleece is dry but the ground is wet, then I will know that God is with me. He, his promises is true, and I am doing the right thing. That night, God did so. Only the fleece was dry. All the ground was covered with dew. Gideon now had triple insurance, assurance, I should say. So here's the question. Gideon was able to use a wool fleece to know the will of God. If God's revelation is now found in Scripture, then how can we know God's will if all that we have is the Bible? I mean, after all, the Bible is just one collection of, of uh, a vast number of books. So how can all Christians find God's will for their life in this one book? How do I know if God wants me to be a teacher or a doctor or a lawyer? How do I know if God wants me to be a missionary or a construction worker? Is the Bible really going to help me find the answer? And here's the answer. Yes. But it requires some further explanation. First, let me just say that the Bible is not a magic eight ball. You guys remember the magic eight balls? Where you can ask a question and you can shake it and you can just wait for this little thing to pop up and eh, it looks okay. You should proceed. The Bible is not like that. However, we can find some great guidance in Scripture. If you're wondering whether or not it's God's will for you to marry a specific person, for instance, you're probably not going to find the answer in the Bible. However, God's Word does reveal His will about all kinds of things that we need to consider as believers when it comes to our spouses, right? So if you're wondering whether God is calling you to be a teacher or a mechanic or something like that, the Bible is probably not going to give you a specific answer. Yes, you should work for this company, right? You should take this job. That's not the kind of revelation that we get in the Bible. But again, the Word of God does help us to know our own gifts, our own strengths, our own passions, so that we can be uh, very accurate in choosing that career path that is fitting for us, based on what we know through Scripture. Sometimes we wonder about things like whether we should make a major purchase. What is God's will for me buying this house? Is there a specific book and, and chapter and verse that we can turn to, to to find the answer to that? No. But once again, the Bible is not giving you a, nay, a yay or nay answer to, as to whether you should buy a new home. However, God's word gives us all sorts of details in how believers should handle their money and think about our finances, right? So generally speaking, we can say that the kinds of revelations that God gives us in his word give us broad categories as how we should live as a people of faith. And we can follow that and know that those are God's will. And if we encounter situations where we have to choose between holding on to these true biblical revelations or to ignore them and follow our own feelings or emotions, well, then it's our own fault when things don't go as planned and everything falls apart because we were not following that will that was revealed in the scriptures. I know there's examples of, uh, you know, people fall in love. One of them's a Christian, the other one's not. What's the Bible say about that? What's the will of God about that? And, of course, the, uh, the feelings and emotions come into play then, right? Well, this person will change. I know they will. Yeah, probably not. And that creates a lot of heartache and, and difficulty. And if you just look to those things that God has already revealed in his word about what your life should be like, it saves us a whole lot of trouble. We get a whole lot of information. And in regard to finding God's will, God will never call us or guide us to do something that is contrary to what he has already revealed in Scripture. I remember Dr. David Jeremiah told a story about a man who came into his office one day and he declared that God was calling him to abandon his wife because God had given him another woman, presumably a better looking woman, I don't know. Dr. David Jeremiah wisely responded, I don't know who's behind this calling you believe that you've been feeling, but I can tell you based on Scripture that it's not coming from God. This is an example of God's will revealed in his word, in this case, about the sanctity of marriage and a person's feelings or emotions trying to do something else, moving away from that and living differently. So what we can say generally is that if you want to know the will of God in a particular instance, the first place that we need to look is in the word. What are the categories that God has addressed that are applicable to this particular issue that you are facing? And once we know that, 
and we have a pretty good idea of how we should take the next steps, how we should proceed, or not proceed, as the case might be. But more than that, God has given us something else. He's given us the gift of the Holy Spirit. As we said, the Spirit's role in our lives is vastly different than it was in the life of Gideon in the entire Old Testament, actually. For Gideon, the Spirit of God was an external force that came to him, empowered him for divine service. But because of the Lord Jesus Christ, you and I have been given the Spirit of God who has literally taken up residence within us. He's no longer something that is exterior and out there that comes to us, but he lives right here within us. We've become the dwelling place, the temples of God. What that means is that we have access to the presence of God all the time and everywhere we go. Paul tells us that we are to what? Walk by faith. Live by faith. Live your life in the constant presence of the Spirit of God. To live under the direction of God's Spirit is to live under his guidance. And what that means is that if we are wrestling with some issue or some major decision, that it me, it, for us, it's the proper place to find the answer, to get the decision, to find God's will is on our knees. We seek God in prayer. We look for God's prompting, the Spirit's prompting, the Spirit's guidance through the prayers that we make, listening for God's direction. And what we can trust is that the Spirit of God will never contradict the Word of God, which tells us that when we seek God in prayer, the Spirit will guide us and convict us and affirm us and inspire us, hopefully. Let us know that we are on the right path and doing the right thing. But if you were bringing something to the Lord in prayer and you have a, let's call it an unsettling feeling or an uneasy feeling about it, it is a good indication that this is not the will of God, that maybe you should take a pause and just reevaluate some things. If, on the other hand, you have a peace about this issue and you have a calming affirmation about a particular thing, no matter what it might be, it's a pretty good indication that you're on the right track. Take that next step. Our problem, of course, is usually twofold. The first is that we don't even know what God has revealed in his word. There's lots and lots of people, uh, despite being Christians for many, many decades, who remain biblically illiterate, essentially. They don't know what the Bible says about anything. And the second is that we do not seek the Lord's guidance through this wonderful gift of prayer. In fact, a lot of times we don't want it because we know what will happen if we do get on our knees and we start seeking the Lord's prayer. He's going to give us an answer that we don't want to hear. So we avoid it because we're ruled by our feelings, ruled by our emotions. And if we ignore both of these things, God's word and the gift of prayer, then how can we possibly hope to know the will of God in our own lives? As Christians, we need those two things desperately in our lives, to work together so that we understand that we are doing what God has called us to do. God's word and spirit agree in revealing his will for our lives. Unlike Gideon, we do not need to go invest in a fleece and throw it out to find God's will. Anytime we need more assurance than, than what we typically have, we look to the word. We look to what God has already revealed to us. But if we need things like the fleece, if we look for those other things that bolster us in our own confidence about what God has already said, then it only reveals our lack of faith, our lack of trust. Gideon had already received the will of God, and yet he required two more signs before he was willing to live in obedience. Of course, God would use Gideon to bring about that will. He condescended to, with condensation, and by his patience and by his mercy, he used Gideon to bring about his will, a simple farmer would indeed become Gideon, the mighty man, the mighty warrior in the presence of God. And what that tells us is that God's will will enable us to do great things for his kingdom when we embrace that will. And we are obedient to what God is wanting us to do because God's power is then flowing through us. We are exactly where we need to be. And so the question is, what is God's will for your life? Do you know? 
Have you tried to find out? The problem of trying to know God's will is not a problem at all if we are willing to seek it out and receive it and be obedient to it. God has revealed his will about many things that we have to deal with in this life, and we can find those things in our scriptures. But when we need more than that, he has also given us this wonderful gift of the Holy Spirit to guide us even further. Each and every person is known by God and has been created for a purpose. What is your purpose? What were you created for? Let us live not needing our own fleeces, but rather in complete trust in the promise that God has made to us and to all those who call on him in faith. He has revealed himself. Let us believe it. Let us embrace it. And let us live by it. Just pray together. Our gracious God, we thank you for the lessons that we learn from the scriptures. Sometimes those lessons are from people who are exemplars of what it means to be a follower of God and be obedient. Sometimes those examples are people who have done it wrong. We can learn from both examples. And in the case of Gideon, Lord, we know that he needed some additional insurance before he would trust you. Let us not fall in that same category. Let us... Look to your word to receive that word and to live obediently without any additional need for trust and assurance that what you say is true. We thank you for the gift of life. And because we have that gift, Lord, we know that we have been created for a purpose. And so we pray that all of us would seek your will to know what it is that you have called us to do so that we can partner with you in doing great things even miraculous things for the kingdom of God. Hear these prayers that we offer in Jesus' name. Amen.